Okay, uh, greetings students. So I'm going to be doing a video here to talk over the solution guide. Actually, I'm just kind of going to kind of wing it and uh, show you guys the solutions to practice exam two, um, which can be found on the blackboard. Uh, so a disclaimer before you start watching this video, I'd really recommend that you try to do this entire practice exam on your own and use the video solution guide as a way to check your work. Okay, that's going to be the best way for you to learn. It's going to be the best way for you to identify, uh, you know, sort of holes or gaps in your knowledge. Uh, and, you know, math is not a spectator sport. So please try the problems on your own before you um, watch this video. The exam is on March 8th. I think I put that in like every video for the last three weeks. <laughs> so the exam's on March 8th, and um, yeah, I guess with that, we'll just go ahead and get into it. Oh, I should probably talk about this disclaimer too. So okay, the practice exam is not comprehensive, all right? This is not something that's designed to be your end-all, be-all study guide for the exam. It's just something to give you kind of a smattering of the topics, and it's to give you sort of an idea of the types of problems that I might give on an exam or the way that I ask problems on an exam. So it's supposed to tell you the format and the length and the general I some of the general ideas, but not necessarily to be a, like a facsimile of the content that will be on the actual exam. Okay, so if you want to know how else to study, I'd recommend coming to my office hours, going to the SI sessions, checking out the problems in the back of those sections in the book, uh, so reading the ebook, going back and watching our lectures, and you know, as as you can make that really targeted and, and focus in on the topics that have been really confusing to you, I think that's really kind of the best use of your time. Okay, so I won't waste any more time talking about that, and uh, we'll just kind of start in, start in on this. Okay, so question one, we've got to find two distinct points on the graph of y equals log 5 of x. Okay, so this is an equation and its graph is going to be the set of values x comma y such that if I plug x into the equation, I get y on the other side. So two distinct points on the gra graph of a logarithm function, uh, I can just automatically know that log functions or log a functions always have one comma zero and a comma one on the graph. That's something we talked about. Um, but if you don't, didn't remember that, then you could also just try plugging in some values of x. So I could also just try, well, log of one equals y if and only if, oh sorry, log 5 of 1 is equal to y if and only if 5 to the power y equals 1 and that tells me that y should be 0. So this is telling me that the point 1 comma 0 is on the graph. You could also try plugging in some other values of x. You could plug in some random values and get some decimals but I kind of like to plug in a value which log 5 is going to be easy to compute for, so I'm going to pick a value of x, which is a power of 5. Okay, so I'm going to try what happens if I do y equals log 5 of 5. Well, this is true if and only if 5 to the y equals 5. And if this equation is true, then I know that y should be equal to 1. And therefore, 5 comma 1 is on the graph. So my answer for this problem would be 5 comma 1 and 1 comma 0. Those are two distinct points on the graph for that function. Okay, so next up we're supposed to explain in words the effect of the transformation. Uh, got a little bit messy here of the transformation uh, g of x equals log 5 of negative x if we consider the parent function to be just log 5 of x. So the previous function is our parent function and we're going to transform it by adding this minus sign on the inside here. 
okay? Minus sign on the inside. And I know that if I have a minus sign on the inside, that is going to correspond to a reflection about, well, since the minus sign is on the inside of our parentheses, this is going to correspond to a reflection about the y-axis. Okay, aka left and right. Uh, to see why that's true, you can just look at the graph of, of you know, y equals log 5 of x. And you say, okay, now what I'm going to do is for any point negative x, what I should do is plug in x into log 5 of x. And that's how I would get the height of that part of the function. And which is how you can see that basically all of these heights are going to get copied over onto the left side of our graph. So this is a reflection about the y-axis. Okay, so next we've got to uh, solve for x in this kind of crazy looking equation. Um, and I'm going to show you two things. The first, uh, first thing I'm going to show you is the right way to do this problem, and then I'm going to show you how somebody might get tripped up by this problem. Okay, so first off, the right way. is to recognize first that we have log 5 of 3 on both sides, minus log 5 of 3 on both sides. I can cancel that out. Okay, if you want, you can think of it as log, add log 5 of 3 to both sides. So I wind up with what? 2 log 5 of x is equal to log 5 of x. And then what I could do is I can just subtract over, right? These are like terms. We have 2 times something is equal to 1 times something. So what I'm going to do is just subtract log 5 of x from both sides. Two times something minus one times something is just log 5 of x. And that's going to be equal to 0. And now I want to consider the equation here is going to be 5 to the 0 equals x, and that means that x is equal to 1. And I'm done. Okay, so that's sort of the right way to think about this problem. And the other way is not necessarily the wrong way per se. Um, but it can get you into a little bit of trouble if you're not careful. So I'll so show you the dangerous way. That's what we'll call it, the dangerous way. The dangerous way is to say, well, I'm just going to combine all of these logs using the log rules. So the left-hand side can become log 5 of x squared over 3. And that's equal to the right-hand side, which would be log 5 of x over 3. And since I have both of these things in the same function, I can do, I can undo the log with a 5 power, so 5 to these things. And then I would just get x squared over 3 equals x over 3, and therefore x, mi x squared minus x is equal to 0. And then we get uh, x is equal to either 0 or x is equal to 1. And if I put this answer, I would be in a little bit of trouble for the following reason. It's true that x equals 1 is a solution to this equation. However, even though x equals 0 will cause x squared minus x to be equal to 0, it's not, strictly speaking, a solution of this equation here for the reason that I can't actually evaluate log 5 of 0. It's undefined. Actually, it doesn't exist. If you want to ask what is log 5 of 0, well, it's the value. If we have y equals log 5 of 0, 
If you want to know why this is nonsensical, just look at the exponential equation. It would be 5 to the y is equal to 0. And you go ahead and try to find a value y such that when you plug it in for a power of 5, you get 0. You actually won't be able to do it. Okay, you won't be able to do that. Okay, because no matter how negative you make y, it's still going to just be like 1 over 5 to that power. And it'll be something maybe really close to zero, but never actually getting to zero. Okay, this is an exponential function. And exponential functions, as long as they're not transformed, they have an asymptote at y equals zero. So, okay, that's enough about that. So just be careful if you solve these log problems. If you wind up with a few solutions at the end, or even just one solution, you should double check really quickly that it's okay for those values of x to be plugged into our original equation. All right, so that's two ways to solve that problem. We got the right way and the dangerous way, which is still okay as long as you are careful. Make sure you actually throw that one out. So actually we just get x equals one. Okay, so that's how we do that one. Going to keep going kind of rapid fire on these, I guess. Uh, so here we've got one that says 1 over 3 to the power x is equal to 27 to the power 4. Okay, so we have an exponential equation here. So the thing we're after is in the power here. So I could try to use some logs, maybe ln, to get them out. Um, and that would work okay and we'd, we'd get where we want to go. Uh, but this is actually an example of a exponential equation in which we can use the, what I think we called it, the matching method uh, in class. And the reason is I can recognize that 1 3rd and 27 are both powers of 3. 1 third is equal to 3 to the negative 1, and 27 is equal to 3 cubed. So I can rewrite this equation as 3 to the negative 1 to the power x is equal to 27. Uh, sorry, not 27, but rather 3 to the power 3 to the 4. And now I just want to solve for x. And the way I can do that is just by rewriting this by as 3 to the power negative x is equal to 3 to the power if I have a power to a power it should be multiplied so 12 and then we just see that negative x is equal to 12 and therefore x is equal to negative 12 and that's how we solve something like that Okay, so all we want to do here is match these bases. Once we have the bases matched, we can just set the powers equal. Okay, so we just rewrite in a clever way. All right. So number two, we got a bunch of true and false questions. And I think, actually, all of these are false. <laughs> So we'll go through and, and check each one. The first one, we've got log of x squared is equal to log of x quantity squared. Okay, and this should immediately set off red flags in your head because we know that we learned that the most important rule about logs was the one involving logs of powers. And that rule was that log of x to the p is equal to p times log of x. So that rule tells us that log of x squared should actually be equal to 2 log of x, which is not in general equal to uh, log of x squared. Uh, to see why this inequality is, is not equal, uh, just try plugging in some number for this thing. So like try, I don't know. 10 maybe. Well, 2 log of 
10 is not equal to log of 10 squared because the left hand side is 2 times 1 and the right hand side is just 1 squared and 2 is not equal to 1. I know that for sure. Oops, I probably shouldn't do that. Okay. Oh, just kind of section that off then. Okay, so that's a really common mistake that people make when talking about logs. So that's why I put it on here just to check and uh, make sure you're aware of this power rule here. This is really probably the most important rule we learn about logs. So make sure that that's one of the ones you know for the exam. Okay, the second equation says, or the second problem says, y is equal to, oh, so this is false, by the way. y is equal to e to the x if and only if log of x is equal to y. Okay, if and only if log of x is equal to y. And let's just remember what the log of x equal to y means. Log of x equal to y. Oh, and man, this should have been... Okay, well, this is false for two reasons. First of all, we would definitely want this to say ln if we're talking about e. Okay, but I think it's still false even if we use ln, because if we use log x equals y, the corresponding exponential equation is going to be 10 to the y is equal to x. So even if this said ln, it would be ln of x is equal to y if and only if e to the y is equal to x. Okay, so this is very different from what we wrote up here. Up here we had y is equal to e to the x, and e to the y is equal to x is sort of the opposite of that thing. So this one's again false, it's double false actually. First because we don't use log with e to the x, we use ln. And second of all, because x and y are switched. Okay, so now let's check C here. If, we, if f of x is equal to 2 to the x, then the inverse of f is equal to x squared. And we can check this really easily by doing the following thing. The property of the inverse function says that f negative 1 of f of x should be equal to x, and f of f negative 1 of x should be equal to x. So let's try. If we do, we'll do f of f negative 1 of x and c. Well, that would be equal to 2 to the x. Uh, 2 to the x squared actually is what it would be. And if we try plugging in x, well, sorry to say that 2 to the x squared is not equal to x. So, no, it's not the inverse. If we wanted to find the inverse of f of x equals 2 to the x, what we would do is we'd write y equals 2 to the x and then switch x and y. So then we would have, to find the inverse, we'd have x equals 2 to the y. And then to get y out, we'd do log 2. So we get log 2 of x is equal to y. So f inverse of x would actually be equal to log 2 of x. Okay. So x squared is not how we undo 2 to the x. Even though they look like they're kind of switched around in this kind of weird way. They're, they're not inverses. Okay, part D is a, is a freebie. Okay, it says 5x plus 3 over 5 plus 3 is equal to x. This isn't even really subject matter of the second exam per se, but this is one mistake that I want all students to avoid. Okay, and the mistake people make is they see this expression and they say well we've got a 5 here and a 5 here and a 3 here and a 3 here so we just cancel all that stuff 
and uh, all we're left with is X. Okay, so this is a big no-no. We can't cancel things like this. Here's why. Really, this is 5x over 5 plus 3 uh, plus 3 over 5 plus 3, which is equal to 5x over 8 plus 3 over 8. Okay, and we can't cancel these things here. And we certainly can't cancel 5 and 8, right? None of these numbers are, are really cancelable. Okay, so the issue here that's causing this to not work is really this plus sign in the denominator. Okay, when we're adding things in the denominator, we can't just we can't just uh, cancel things because what we're really doing if we're canceling things would be we'd be multiplying 1 over 5 on the bottom but we'd have to multiply it by the entire denominator and we'd have to multiply the entire numerator by 1 over 5 if we wanted to cancel a 5 and the issue with this canceling process is we would have to distribute then so this is not how we cancel things Okay, so next up we've got uh, an annual compound interest rate of 6% is equal or equivalent to a continuous interest rate of 6%. And this is kind of really pointing out the whole, the whole point of what I've been trying to tell you guys kind of about the banks and how sneaky they are. Or just like, I don't know, financial stuff in general. I feel like it's always built to confuse you in order to exploit you. Uh, and this is a sad example of that, okay? If we have compound interest rate of 6%, it's not equivalent to a compound int to a continuous interest rate of 6%. And all we have to see to, val to verify whether this is true or not is, well, if we set up the equation a0 times 1.06 to the power t, and we set it equal to a naught e to the kt, uh, e to the 0 0.06 t, sorry. We just have to check whether this equation is true. And to see that it's not true, simply cancel the a naught, and then do the ln of both sides. We'd get ln of 1.06, and we bring that t down front. That would be equal to, if we do the ln of e to the 0.06t, we just get 0 0.06t. And then we can cancel the t's. And then we just have to verify, well, is ln of 1.06 equal to 0 0.06? If you plug ln, ln in on your calculator, let's see what we can get here. LN of 1.06. We want to check if that's equal to 0 0.06. If we do this, we wind up getting 0 0.0582 dot dot dot. So this one's equal to 0 0.0582 dot dot dot. And we want to check, is that equal or not to 0 0.06? No. So the answer is false. If you're earning a continuous interest rate, okay, you're actually earning a slightly different rate than if that interest is being compounded uh, annually. And by rate, I mean the annual percentage yield will be different. Okay. So let's see here. We'll, we'll move on from that. Okay, next question we've got it says showing all work, solve for the all values of x such that this function is equal to zero. 
And they even give us a hint here, give us a hint that f of 1 is equal to 0. See, that's very nice. Very nice of them to give us that hint. So I have a cubic function here that's set equal to 0. So the way I handle this is I want to factor x cubed plus 4x squared plus x minus 6 and then set it equal to 0 and then we'll have all of the factors will be zeros, uh, will each be zeros that is. So if I know that if I plug in 1 is equal to 0 then I know this is telling me that x minus 1 is a factor of f of x. If x minus 1 is a factor of f of x, then I know I can do long division, and it's going to come out even, evenly. Okay, I'm not going to have any remainder. So that's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to try to write this. I'm going to do some work, and then eventually write f of x as being equal to x minus 1 times some other thing where this should be a quadratic. And then I'll factor that quadratic using our usual techniques. And then I'll just set all the factors equal to zero and then I'll be done. So let's do it. If I take x cubed plus 4x squared plus x minus 6, and I want to divide out x minus 1, now let's hope hope beyond all hope that I don't make any mistakes here. Okay, first of all, what should go in this yellow blank here should be whatever I get if I take x cubed and divide by x, the leading term in my divisor. So it's going to be x squared, and if I take x squared and multiply it by x minus 1 and subtract, I get x square uh, cubed minus x squared. So if I subtract that, then what do I get? Well, the x cubeds cancel out. That's kind of by design. And then I'll have a 4x squared plus x squared. So I get 5x squared plus x minus 6. And now I repeat the process. I want to take this 5x squared and divide it by x. And I get 5x, and now I'm going to subtract 5x squared is what I get if I do 5x times x, and if I do 5x times negative 1, I get negative 5x. And now I cancel out those 5x squareds, and I just have to take x here and add 5x to it. So I get 6x minus 6, and it's seeming like this is going to work out. And the last part will be 6, and 6 times x minus 1 will subtract 6x minus 6 from 6x minus 6, and we get 0. So I divided this polynomial, this cubic polynomial, time by one of its roots, okay, or by one of its factors, that is, and I got a quadratic equation. So where I wanted to put that quadratic, I have it now. It'll be x squared plus 5x plus 6 is equal to 0. And now I just have to do one more thing, and that's basically to factor this, this thing. Okay, so I'll factor it. So that'll be equal to x minus 1 times x plus 2, I think, and x plus 3. Two numbers which add to 5 and uh, multiply to 6. And that's equal to 0, and therefore we have x is equal to either 1 or x is equal to 2, uh, negative 2, or x is equal to negative 3. Those are my x values which will cause this to be 0. And you can check them if you want. If you're worried about something having gone wrong, just take these values and plug them into this formula here, and you'll get zero.
Okay. So the next next question I really like actually. We're gonna need a calculator for this, by the way. Probably won't give you any problems on the exam that would necessitate a calculator. Um, we want to know, <laughs> is x minus 4 a factor of this god-awful looking polynomial? And there's kind of two ways that I could go about this. The painful way would be to try to do long division of x minus 4 and then put this polynomial in here and see does the long division work out or not? <laughs> and this is really painful. Because you got to do long division on a quintic polynomial and it's just going to take a long time. There's going to be a lot of steps. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for you to make a mistake. What we should do instead is recognize that we, we had a fact in class that we learned that x minus a is a factor of f of x if and only if f of a is equal to zero. So rather than checking if x minus a is a factor of f of x, I'm going to instead check is f of a equal to zero. So all I have to do is check f of 4 equals 4 to the fifth power minus 4x to the fourth power minus 15, oops, should have been 4 times 4 to the fourth power minus 15 times 4 cubed, plus 50 times 4 squared, uh, plus 64 times 4, minus 96. And it's true. This is actually equal to 0. Uh, I'm not going to type all this into my calculator now, just because uh, that would be kind of a waste of time. but. You can check it on your own, uh, or you can trust me. Okay, so so this is actually true, so yes, it is a factor. So kind of a, just using a bit of logic here, we know that, you know, we know that condition one will be true if and only if condition two is true. And condition one is really hard to check. So instead, check condition two, which is easy to check. And use the fact that if condition two is true, then condition one has to be true as well. So that's just some logic. I really like that problem. Okay, I have a sip of water here, parching myself out here. All right, next question, question number four. We have a polynomial inequality quadratic inequality even. And I want to know, when is this quadratic larger than zero? Okay, so there's two ways that I can sort of do this. I can think about this graphically, or I can do the usual method. So the usual method would be to first factor, and then put uh, zeros on the number line and then check each region. Okay. 
and then we would ha correspond uh, like greater than and less than signs go with a with a parentheses, and then we have greater than or equal to signs and less than or equal to signs. These go with our brackets. So we can do that. We'd get x minus 5 times x minus 5. That's how it factors. It's equal to 0. So we only have one root, and it's just 5. And we would pick a test point from each region to the left and right of 5. So I'd pick 0 and probably 6. And I'd try plugging them in and see what I get. Well, if I plug in 0, I'll do negative 5 times negative 5, and I'll get 25, which is indeed larger than 0, so that's a check mark. And if I wanted to check 6, well, I'd get, uh, well, I'd get 1 times 1. f of 0 would be equal to, or 6 would be equal to 1 times 1, which is 1, which is larger than 0. So this region's also good. So since I have a less than sign, I would correspond that with parentheses. So I would have an open dot on 5 and squiggles to the right and squiggles to the left. And I would write that as negative infinity comma 5 union 5 comma infinity. So what we found out was there's actually only one point on the entire real line where this inequality is not true, and that's the value of x when x is equal to 5. And that's not hard to see if you try to look at this. I think this is too hard to see. I'm going to switch back to blue. If you look at this graphically, if you just factor this equation, you get x minus 5 squared. It's larger than 0. And this is a parabola with vertex. 5, 0. And so if I showed you this picture of a parabola which looks like this, oops, I showed you a picture of a parabola that looks like this, and I ask you where is the, in which <laughs> regions of the x-axis caused the parabola to be above the x-axis, well, it's just everywhere except for this one bad point. So our answer then would be negative infinity comma 5 union 5 comma infinity. So that's another way to think about that. Alright, next up we have an inequality involving a rational expression. And uh, we're basically just going to use this, this method again here, where we do the factoring, put the zeros on the number line, check each region, and then the only thing that we're going to have to worry about is making sure that we put a parentheses around any boundaries involving this denominator being zero. OK, so we'll do it the right way, and then I'll show you the trap. So the right way, I'm just going to put all these things on a number line because they've already been factored. We get 1 and 2. Okay, now I'm just going to take a test point from each region here. I'm going to pick 0, uh, 3 halves, and 3. I'm going to try plugging them into my function and see what I get. Well, if I plug in 0, I would get negative 1 times negative 2 divided by negative 1 is going to be negative 2, which is less than or equal to 0. So this region passes. Then if I plug in 3, then I'd get uh, 3 minus 1 is 2 times 3 minus 2 is 1 divided by 1 is equal to 2. 
and uh, 2 is not less than or equal to 0. So this region is bad. Now we just have to check the middle region, 3 halves. Well, I do 3 halves minus 1 half would be, or 3 halves minus 1 would be uh, 1 half. And then we'd multiply that times 3 halves minus 2 would be negative a half. And we'd divide that by 1 half. And we would get that this is equal to like negative 1 half, which is less than or equal to 0. So this region is good. Okay, and because I have a less than or equal to sign, okay, I'm going to use closed dots. Except where the denominator is zero. So I'm going to go ahead and recognize that the denominator is zero when x is equal to one. So the very first thing I'm going to do is put an open dot on one. I'm going to put a closed dot on my other point. And then I'm going to fill in the regions which have which are good, and I'm going to not fill in the regions which are bad. And if I was going to interpret this in terms of x being in an interval, well, I want the interval negative infinity comma 1 with a parenthesis, union parentheses 1 comma 2 bracket. And I don't fill in anything to the right of 2 because that region caused this inequality to be false. So this is how we do this, okay? This is how we do this. And I'll show you now the trap. So this is what you're not supposed to do. Here's a common mistake. student might see this, x minus 1 times x minus 2, and divide by x minus 1. And so they say, aha, uh -huh, x minus 1, those cancel. And we just get x minus 2 is uh, less than or equal to 0. So x is less than or equal to 2. So our interval should be negative infinity comma 2. Bracket. And you know, this student is almost right in a way, except they're neglecting to, to throw out the possibility of x being equal to 1. You see, if x is actually equal to 1, not only is our inequality not true, our, our actual inequality involving the rational expression, not only is it not true, it doesn't even make sense. It would, it would simplify to 0 divided by 0 is less than or equal to 0. This, this makes no sense. So this interval includes the value, the possible x value 1, while the right way, we wind up excluding it. Okay, so don't, don't fall into that trap there. Um, now that you're aware of it, and yeah, just just make sure that you use our use our algorithm properly. Okay. Question number five. So we have two functions here. We're supposed to find their domain and range. Okay. Well, here I have an exponential function. I know that a to the x has domain of all real numbers and range 0 comma infinity. And I know this, okay, this is a function which looks like a to the x, except it's been shifted to the left one and down 3. So if I take the domain, remember the x values, 
which have to do with left and right. And I take R and move it to the left one unit. Well, I still have R. So the domain is R. And I know that my range goes from 0 to infinity. So the y values of a to the x, or e to the x, doesn't matter, range from 0 to infinity. So if I move this whole interval down three units, what am I going to get? If I move it down three units, I just get that the range should be negative 3 comma infinity. Okay? And here's how you can think about it. Um, okay, I can't zoom for some reason. There we go. Here's how you can think about it. You just look at the function and, and kind of ignore everything else. You know that this first part is some positive number to some power we know that the smallest possible thing that that could possibly be, this is larger than or equal to zero and less than only one thing, infinity. Uh, okay, well, I shouldn't put it like that because then it looks like an eight. I know that e to the x plus one is less than or equal, or larger than or equal to zero and it's less than infinity. So if I just do e to the x plus 1 minus 3, it's going to be less than infinity minus 3, and it's going to be larger than or equal to 0 minus 3, which means that we get negative 3 is less than or equal to e to the x plus 1 minus 3 is less than, well, infinity minus 3, still infinity. So that's how you can recognize that part. Okay. Now this second one I think is a little bit trickier. I've got g of x here, and it's a it's a composition of functions, right? This is this is a, a composition of functions where the inside function is a square root of x minus three, and the outside function is ln of x. So this is ln of x composed with square root x minus 3. And what we said uh, way back when was that the domain of a composition of functions is going to be the domain of the inner function. Uh, or the values which are in the domain of the inner function, which map to something which is in the domain of the second function. Okay, so we need two things to be true. First of all, we need x minus 3 to be larger than or equal to 0 so that uh, square root of x minus 3 makes sense. And then we need square root of x minus 3 to be larger than 0 so that when we do the natural log, we're doing the natural log of a positive number. ln of square root of x minus 3 makes sense. So two kind of things to consider here. If we solve this first inequality, that just tells us that x should be larger than or equal to 3. And if we solve this second equation by squaring both sides, we would get x minus 3 is larger than 0 squared equals 0. And then we would add 3 over to the other side, and we would get x is larger than 3. And we need both of these conditions to be true. For the entire thing to make sense. So if we need x larger than or equal to 3 and x is larger than 3, this is telling us that 
we need x is larger than 3. That's the only condition that will make both of those things true. Okay, so our domain is going to be uh, 3 comma infinity, but we should use parentheses. And then our range is just going to be the usual range of a natural log uh, function, right? If we transform negative infinity to infinity by moving it around, well, we're still going to have negative infinity to infinity, okay? All right. So that's how we do this one. All right, I'm a little bit low on time. I want to make sure I have time to go through these next two, so I'm going to pause the video here and I'll come back and record the rest of this in a little while. Okay, I'm back to continue this practice exam. So we left off with question number six, and question number six asks us to find the half-life of a given substance. Okay, so we have a substance here which decays from 12 kilograms to 9 kilograms in three years. And we want to know what the half-life of the substance is. Okay, so remember we model radioactive decay using A of T is equal to uh, A naught e to the kt, and we use the continuous uh, rate here. Okay, we use the continuous rate because half-life, or sorry, uh, radioactive substances, they, they, they tend to be, you know, emitting radiation all the time, okay? So they're, the process of radioactive decay is sort of continuous, and it's not modeled as well by 1 plus r to the t, for example, because typically what we do with something like this is we only allow increments of one unit of time, uh, so like one year. So a bank might take your interest or your account balance and they might compute your interest at the end of the year and give it as a lump sum. Whereas radioactive decay is sort of happening all the time, and so it's it's sort of a continuous process as opposed to like at the end of the year, half of the substance just randomly disappears all at once. It's a continuous thing. So that's why we tend to use uh, the exponential form for half-life problems. And let's see here. So what's the information that we're given? We're given that we start with 12 kilograms. So we know A naught is equal to 12. And we actually aren't given what K is. Ultimately, we want to solve for T. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to take the information which is packaged here, 12 kilograms to 9 kilograms in three years, and use that to figure out what K is and then I'll work on figuring out what the half-life is. So first I know that 12 years, that's, well, 12 kilograms after three years, that means t is equal to three, then a of three is equal to nine. And this is my a naught here, and then uh, a of three is gonna be my, my nine kilograms. So the way I'd write that is a of three is equal to nine, that's the ending amount after three years. And that'll be equal to my starting amount, which was 12, times e to the k. And here the number of years elapsed has been 3, so I put a 3 here. And now I'm just going to take this equation and solve for k to find out what the rate of decay is. Once I know the rate of decay, I can figure out how long it takes at that given rate of decay for the substance to decay by half. So to solve this, I'll just get, I'll divide both sides by 12, I'll get 3 quarters is equal to e to the 3k, and then I'll apply the natural log in order to figure out what k is. And then I'll solve that for k, and we get k is equal to ln of 3 quarters 
divided by 3. Okay, so pretty simple process here. Just solve this equation for k. And now our updated formula Our formula before was just a of t equals 12e to the kt. Now we can update it. It's going to be a of t is going to be equal to 12e to the ln of 3 quarters over 3 times t. And we want to know how long does it take for the substance to decay by half. So if we start with 12 kilograms, then we should end up with 6. So we want to find t such that the following happens. We get 6 is equal to 12 times e to the ln of 3 quarters over 3 times t. And now we have an equation where we know everything except for t. So since we know everything except for t, we can just solve this equation by, well, first we'll get rid of this 12 here. We'll divide it out. We got 1 half is equal to e to the ln of 3 quarters over 3 times t. And then to solve this equation, we just need to apply the natural log to get t out of that exponent there. So we get... this and some simple algebra we just get t is going to be equal to ln of one half um, times three divided by ln of three quarters and we can compute that using our calculator see what we would get with the ln of one half times three and then we divide all of that by ln of 3 quarters. And we get 7.22-ish years. Okay, and that makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. It's going to take longer than double of this time because we were given basically how long does it take for 25% of it to go away for an additional 25% since the d decay depends on how much we have. It should take longer than three years. So this, this answer kind of fits with our, our understanding from chemistry. So Again, the process here, first figure out the rate of decay, then once we know the rate of decay, use the equation, which only has one unknown now, to find out the value of t which produces uh, half of the original substance. Okay, so the next problem is, is two basically two graphing problems. Okay, and we're supposed to graph these rational expressions. Okay, and I'm gonna label any and all asymptotes and holes in my graph. Okay, so here I have a pretty simple one. Okay, this is just a transformation of, of one over x. Okay, so I should expect the graph to look a little bit like one over x, you know, something like uh, what looks like this. Uh, but let's let's see if we can figure out uh, using our mathematical principles what this should look like. So first of all, I recognize that the bottom is going to be zero if x is equal to two, and this is telling me that x is equal to two is a vertical asymptote. Okay. So that's first. Uh, and then also, since the numerator doesn't have any powers of x, if I compare the power of the numerator, n of x, it's just 0. And then the power of 
um, x minus 2, the denominator, is 1. So since the denominator has a, a higher degree, I know that this is telling me that I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to 0. Okay, so let's just draw in my asymptotes. Here's x equals to 2. That's x equals 2. And then I'll have one at y is equal to 0 as well. And now I just need to determine what is the behavior. Does it look something like this? Or does it look like going down on both sides? Or what's happening with respect to that? Okay, and the way I tell this is by using my, my handy old chart that I gave us. Okay, I can see that the multiplicity of this denominator, the zero in the denominator, has multiplicity one, which is odd. Okay, so I know I'm not gonna, I can rule out the behaviors where they both go in the same direction. Okay, I can rule out those behaviors, since those only happen when the multiplicity of the denominator is zero, uh, even. And then I just have to check what is the value of uh, f of x times x minus 2, okay? So basically, I just want to consider what is the value of the function if I, if I just don't even think about this x minus 2 being here. And it's going to be equal to 4, and that's a number which is larger than 0, which means that our function is going to look just like 1 over x. Okay, you can check the table, uh, but I'm confident that this is going to look something like this, down on the left side and up on the right side. And if you want to be extra super sure, you can take an x value which lies to the right but pretty close to our asymptote and check if you plug in what you get. Well, if I took x equals 3 here, then f of 3 would be equal to 4 divided by 3 minus 2, which is a positive number after all. And I could also try x is equal to 1. Well, if I plug x is equal to 1, then I would get f of 1 is equal to 4 over 1 minus 2 would be equal to negative 4. Okay, so that's making me feel extra confident in my answer here. In fact, my graph literally passes through the correct points. Fantastic. Okay, well, forget about the part where it just starts going to the right there. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with, with the way this graph looks. I've labeled my horizontal asymptotes. I've labeled my vertical asymptotes. And I have the right direction of behavior near the asymptote. That's really the most important thing is, you know, if your graph looks a little bit funny in some other places, I'm not going to sweat that, but as long as you have the arrows drawn in the right direction, uh, I'll be pretty happy with it. Okay, so that's how we do that one, kind of a simpler simpler example. And now let's try this this harder one. Okay, so in this case, we have uh, a horizontal uh, not a horizontal, what am I talking about? We've got a multiplicity 2 factor in the denominator. Okay, so we know that is maybe going to give us some kind of funny same side behavior, right? Like uh, both blowing up or both blowing down, one of those two. Uh, and we've also got a little bit of a different thing going on with the numerator. 
So before we had that the numerator had one less degree than the denominator and we know that that kind of meant that as x got large this denominator was going to outweigh the numerator and that was what caused y equals zero to be our horizontal asymptote. In this case if we were to multiply this out what would we get? We get negative x squared divided by the de denominator would be like x squared minus 4x plus 4 and we can see that this degree of the largest leading term here is the same. So n of x and d of x are same degree. That tells me that the horizontal asymptote will be given by dividing the leading terms horizontal asymptote at y equals negative x squared over x squared equals negative 1. Okay, we take those coefficients, right, where the coefficients here are really negative 1 on the numerator and positive 1 on the denominator. So we're going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals po uh, negative 1. I'm going to draw that in. y equals negative 1. And I know already that I'm going to have a vertical asymptote at uh, x equals 2 again. So I'll draw in x equals 2. And now I just have to consider what's happening on both sides of this thing. Okay, I need to consider what's happening. So I know that the multiplicity is 2, which is even. So this is still talking about the vertical asymptote. Multiplicity is 2, so that's an even number. And then if I consider what is the value of this expression sans this denominator term that I'm talking about right now? Near x equals 2, we would get negative 2 squared is equal to negative 4, which is less than 0. Okay, so what is that telling us? That's telling us that when we get, when we take an x value like this blue one, which is very close to x equals 2, then the numerator is going to be a negative number, and the denominator here is going to be, since it's a squared number, it's going to be a really, really small number, but positive, since we're squaring it. So I take a negative number and divide it by a really small positive number, and that's telling me that I should be coming from really low below. Um, probably looks maybe something like this, or it, it might do a little bit of this. Who knows? I don't care what that looks like. I just care that it's going in the same direction as the asymptote. And since I have this multiplicity too, I know that the behavior on both sides should be the same. So on the left-hand side, it's just going to look kind of like this. Okay. And like I said, it, I think it's possible that this thing looks, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more like this. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but the key features of the graph that I'm looking for you to display to me is that the graph is getting really, really close to y equals 1 far over here, or y equals negative 1 getting really close to the horizontal asymptote way to the left, and then we have the right kind of behavior near our vertical asymptote, i.e. both of them should be going down. Okay, it's really the critical, critical thing for these graphs. Okay, and that's it. So I'm going to close this video here, uh, but if you have further questions about any of the proofs that I've done uh, for this video or any of the work that I've done, um, then please just go ahead and email me 
uh, you know my email address and you can reach me um, you know whenever I will try to respond to emails uh, with some quickness over the weekend in case you guys need uh, help while you're studying for that Monday exam so if you need any help please just reach out to me and uh, I will help you out okay well that's it for this video I'll uh, see you next time